Good afternoon, midday, uh, depending on where you're calling from, everyone. Uh, my name is Quang. Welcome to the ISODC webinar with Ed and Peter Shine and my co-host, uh, Kimberly Good. Barker. Um, for this particular webinar, um, we're going to disable the video feeds uh, if you're a participant, we're going to keep everyone muted for the time being. Um, and Kim and I are going to activate the chat room. So please, if you have questions during the discussion in the webinar, please enter your questions into the chat room. And Kim, Kim and I, your host from ISODC, we will do our best to um, read your questions to Ed and Peter so that they can um, address your questions. So welcome again, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kimberly Barker. Thanks, Quang. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the International Society for Organization Development and Change, we would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our presenters today are Edgar and Peter Schein, names many of us know very well. Edgar Schein is the Professor Emeritus of the MIT Sloan School of Management and the Chairman of OCLI.org, or Organizational Culture and Leadership Institute. He is a pioneer in organizational culture studies, process consultation, and career dynamics. The Humble Leadership Book follows three companion books. Helping, Humble Inquiry, and Consulting. Humble Consulting. Dr. Shine is educated at the University of Chicago, Stanford University, and Harvard University. Peter Shine is the co-founder and COO of OCLI.org. Peter is a Silicon Valley executive and consultant. He's consulted with Apple, SGI, Sun Microsystems, and multiple startups. Peter is a participating author of Organizational Culture and Leadership, 5th edition, and a co-author of Humble Leadership. He was educated at Stanford University, Northwestern University, and USC, the Center for Effective Organizations. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Before, before we begin today, it would be nice for some of you in the chat room to tell us where you are in the world today. I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm in Washington. Where are you? I'm in Washington, D.C. We're in Palo Alto, California. Yay! You guys might be the winners. <laughs> Yeah. What are we, what are we seeing? Anything? So, uh, Montreal. Montreal, all right. Uh, the UK, Nottingham, Robin Hood country. <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. Boston. Another Ann Arbor, Michigan. Boston. Uh, Maidstone near Kent, Chicago, Needham. Little Rock, Arkansas, <laughs> South Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, you go ahead, Quang. Uh, <clears throat> Munich, Germany. Houston, Texas, Cincinnati, Ohio, Florida, Cambridge, UK, <laughs> Philly. Philly, Philly. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, thanks for those uh, call outs. It's really fun for us to get a sense of where people are from. Um, also, please. Please share with us if you are a student, practitioner, and academics, or something else. We want to know who is with us today. Uh, 
practitioner, student, consultants, PhD student, both, practitioner and consultant, board member, leader in high tech. Right. Student and human systems interventions. Mm. <coughs> Psychologist. <laughs> I see a couple of uh, coaches in there as well. Mm -hmm. A film and music consultant. Great. <laughs> Need the arts. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. We really want this to be a conversation today. So if you have any questions, if you could please put them in the chat room and Quang and I will um, ask them to Ed and Peter Shine. Okay. Gentlemen, to begin, what would you like to share with us about humble leadership? Well, we, we discussed this among ourselves, and uh, since I have a longer history, I'm going to start with a little bit of that history. Uh, I started out as a social psychologist and was always interested in influence <clears throat> and discovered uh, during my first postdoctoral uh, stint, which was at the Walter Reed Institute of Research, and I was in Germany, that uh, sometimes problems find you rather than academics finding problems because at that time, uh, the Korean War had ended and there was a big armistice and we had three to 4,000 POWs returning from the Chinese and North Korean POW camps uh, and a lot of information that they had been, quote, indoctrinated term brainwashing came into being at that point. So I found myself as part of a military group being sent in groups of, of four psychiatrists, social worker, and a couple of psychologists over to Korea to get on board ship with a couple hundred of the repatriates and during that time back, find out what happened. Were they influenced? How did it all work? So my first book was actually called Coercive Persuasion because I was struck by two things. One, that the captor, the Chinese particularly, has the power to force behavior change. You can create conditions where even the resistant ones will sign false confessions or a march in peace marches and give people propaganda stuff. But nobody bought any of the indoctrination stuff. People did not come out of POW camp believing in Chinese communism or any part thereof. Mm -hmm. So I learned that behavior change is possible, attitude change is a lot more difficult. Start to study that in, uh, in corporate indoctrination found the same thing. If students went to a company <clears throat> and didn't like the culture, the labor market was open enough that they voted with their feet. Uh, a lot of career changes, we see that continuing today. In any case, as I got interested in the companies and the cultures, I began to see how there was an interplay between culture and leadership and how leadership really was a hugely different thing if you're part of a very strong culture that really knows how it wants to do things versus being in a startup where the leader is actually creating the culture by passing on his or her own values to the new people. So as I've gotten farther and farther into the leadership area and also being very interested in, in organization development philosophy, which is more open systems thinking, I have moved more and more into seeing the problem 
of moving from coercive behavior control to humble leadership, which is working with situations and with the people around you uh, to make better things happen. So this book is in that sense a kind of a culmination and a reaffirmation that coercion doesn't work and in a complex world humble leadership does work. So that'll be my little introduction. Thank you. Uh, actually, Kim, I'll just add that, that one of the things that we really try to do in this book is focus a lot on the future. Um, and uh, it sort of starts with the basic proposition that we use the term VUCA, which is, you know, I think originally a military term, but volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Um, that's the world we're in now. And um, the point of departure in many respects is that a traditional um, tailorist hierarchical command and control model for organizations we think is, is ultimately threatened in the future. And so a lot of what humble leadership is about is presenting some other ideas um, that might help us move away from that command and control model, um, which, uh, you know, the well-oiled machine is going to start to break down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, again, that's sort of our point of departure with this book. Thank you. So we've got the levels of relationship up there, which is a good next thing to talk about. <clears throat> As I got more into the leadership area, I also got much more interested in organizational and even broader social societal culture. And what you very quickly discover is that society has organized us somewhat in our daily lives into four levels of relationship, all of which we experience at various times. Uh, when we go to the uh, various administrative places like the Department of Motor Vehicles, we experience level minus one uh, leadership where <clears throat> we wait forever and then get told what to do and feel like mostly victims. That is not particularly an, an industrial model, but you see it occasionally in sweatshops. Uh, so the contemporary management and leadership model that was enormously successful over the last hundred years is what we call level one, which is that you, you organize hierarchies and bureaucracies in terms of jobs. Uh, you maintain physical and social distance between the people in their various roles and you organize these roles to interact, but it's basically an impersonal system, which also then facilitates what in the bigger culture is, is extreme individualism and competitiveness. So what you see then in level one e examples of that is people doing things primarily for their own benefit uh, which may include withholding information from the boss, uh, lying and cheating, what creates the scandals eventually. So we realize that as work gets more complex, these level one role-related transactional relations work less and less well. And we see companies out there that have always understood this from the beginning and moved their relationships to level two, which basically says the boss and the people around him, uh, his own boss, the peers, the direct reports, really you have to get to know them at a personal level in order to establish the key points of openness, that they tell each other the truth and volunteer relevant information, and out of that comes trust and the ability to anticipate how we will relate to each other, which makes complex work possible. And if the work gets super complicated and requires very intimate levels of relationship, like in 
military units like the SEALs. Then there's even what in normal society would be close friendships and family relations spills over even a little bit into the work scene. So humble leadership is all about level two. That's the purpose of showing these levels. And if I can just throw in, I noticed in the in the chat and uh -huh. you responded that there was the uh, requisite question of whether that's a typo. Uh, it's not a typo. That that is the word is personization and. Um, we put that in there in, in, in creating this description of level two as a, way of, as a way of differentiating it from personalization because we're, you know, we're in a world where um, you know, anything that we buy or any interaction we might have with, um, with a benefits coordinator or something, it, that our world is becoming increasingly as individuals increasingly personalized. Um, what we're talking about with personization is something different. It's that process of creating a whole person to whole person relationship, a level two relationship, so that there is that level of openness and trust so that information will flow in an unimpeded, as at least as appropriate, the un unimpeded as possible, because that's how we deal with VUCA, is by um, sharing pertinent information. So personization is the, the word we started using to describe that process of creating that relationship. It's not that personalization isn't, you know, closely related, and we, we all you know, need to have those personal relationships. Mm -hmm. But personalization, we wanted to differentiate from that more specifically to this process of creating openness and trust. Why, why do you think personalization is needed in today's world? Well, the, to repeat the key point, <clears throat> in order to get the relevant information to get the task done. And what we've observed is that with tasks in all the industries, in healthcare, in, uh, in whatever you look at, the tasks that leaders and managers face are getting more complex. My particular interest is, uh, is safety stuff in high hazard industries. Mm -hmm. If there's a mechanic who began to see a flaw in one of the engines and chooses not to report it, we're jeopardizing that airplane's right. total safety and the lives of many people. So the extreme version of this is if you're running a nuclear plant or if you're an airline industry, the, the boss has to be able to believe that if anybody sees anything that jeopardizes performance, that they'll volunteer it and be motivated to volunteer it. That's the trust angle. We have to be able to trust each other. Uh, you have to be able to trust the doctor. Yeah. And more and more doctors are saying they do better if they really get to know their patients mm -hmm. rather than just to treat them as a, as a case on a chart. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's essential to getting quality, safe work accomplished. I was just reading a book the other day on negotiation, and they say that the negotiation goes so much better when both parties get to know each other. I'm not surprised. I'm yeah. glad to, to hear that that is the way they've discovered that. But, you know, it, it's, it does raise this very um, interesting point that there, there has sort of been a couple related myths um, one is that professional distance is good. Mm -hmm. right? we're, 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 we, don't, we're not, we don't know the answer to this, but our basic premise in this book is that professional distance generally isn't good anymore. Mm -hmm. The other one is that in the negotiation frame, Kim, that, that, um, that compromise is bad, right? When you compromise, both people lose. Right. That's that's one of those negotiation myths. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not exactly sure where that myth came from, but I 
I think it's it, it has to be reframed that um, negotiation is a matter of coming together. It's not a matter of winning and losing. I agree. I agree. And I really love your level three. I love that you bring that up to another level. Um, someone asked, uh, CP asked, oh, Quang, do you want to? Um, Go ahead. Yep. That CP asks, it seems like level three could be split. Uh, it seems like there's a difference between intimacy between couples and lovers and families versus high performing teams. Uh, can you explain why you put those two together? Well, because these four levels come out of, out of society. We learn as adults to play all these different roles. And where we learn how to be intimate is in our family and lover relationships. That's where we develop the skills. And the paradox of, of humble leadership is when people say, well, how am I going to learn to be more personal at level two? I typically say you already know how to do that because you do a lot of that already with friends and in your intimate relationships. It's a question of using those same insights and skills and taking some of them over into the work relationship. So that intimacy is a broad social category. And we're sort of saying there are times at work when those social skills that we, that we use in our intimate relationships have to be applied in the work relationship. Does that make sense? It does. When I was, uh, when I was reading the book, I, uh, I was thinking about, I've had two level three uh, work experiences and they're just so special. I mean, they just stand out in your mind and uh, in my mind. And, uh, you know, it was a situation where you could almost read each other's minds, right? Yeah, we've used the, the idea that you can finish each other's sentences. That's, right. that's sort of one of the differences between level two and level three. But it is a perceptive point. And we've, in a number of discussions about this, we've sort of said, you know, um, we already complicated the world by adding this new term personization. We might need to add one other complication, which is there is an idea of a level 2.5, which might better capture the way the members of a SEAL team interact with each other. Um, we also like the sports analogies. It's a lot of times the most successful teams in, you know, we have our Golden State Warriors who, um, are sort of generally considered to be a, 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 a different kind of form of team. Mm -hmm. They have an interaction that, that uh, uh, is unusual in, in the NBA. And um, it, it, so we're, we're trying to get at something that's a, a level of intimacy that isn't, um, isn't, it's a professional intimacy if we can, you know, Okay. You know, muddy the water further, but um, there is something there, and you know it when you see it. And the the coaches use the word love surprisingly often. <laughs> oh, these guys really love each other, and then you begin to see again in the broader social context more and more people saying, "Why? Why do we limit the word love so much?" Shouldn't love be a much broader term yeah. in society to include things that are not just family or lovers? Uh, Terry Moran has this question for the both of you. How do you influence those who are socialized in hierarchy level one to move to level two? And how do you prove that value? Well, the first thing you do is you write books about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one of the related to that is, and we do put this in the book, is to sort of reflect on, you know, your, your, your jobs and your work and um, ask the honest question of yourself, what were the jobs that you liked? What were the work relationships that you liked? Were they... Um, 
you know, everybody was staying in their lane and doing their role and handing off work to the other and hoping they were going to get ahead? Or was it when you created, um, you know, uh, groups and synergies that where, where the team did better and the group did better? Um, there, it's important that we all sort of reflect back on some of the, uh, the work that we've done and, and think what, what really felt better. And generally, we think that people will feel better about the work experiences they've had where the teams thrived more than where I got ahead or you got ahead. Um, Susan has a wonderful question. She says, how do we work with clients to slow things down enough to take the time and recognize the value of getting to know each other as a means of increasing not only job satisfaction, but performance? I, I'd like to deal with that uh, in terms of referring to one of the prior books, which was called Humble Consulting, of which the subtitle is How Do We Provide Help Faster? Because I think this notion that all this takes a lot of time is another myth. Okay. I've discovered that it's a choice I make in every relationship whether I'm going to get personal or not. And I can choose to reveal something very personal immediately to a stranger, to a boss, to a peer, to a client, or I can ask a very personal type question in that context. My, my fantasy was uh, you, you're a new uh, consultant, uh, you're in the client's office, and you see a, a picture on, on the desk of a, of a family, you walk right over to it and say, is that your family? You have personalized the situation immediately. Mm -hmm. There's no way the, the client can put you off and, and say, well, let's not talk about that. Now you've learned something that maybe your relationship with that client is going to have some boundaries. But on the other hand, the client might say, yeah, that's my wife and my kids. Well, what are, where are they? What are they doing? That doesn't take any time. Right. It's a matter of attitude and using your own self to personalize the situation. Thank you. Very important point, because we do have this myth that consulting and building relationships always is going to be a long process and people will be impatient. I've discovered that it's up to me how quickly this works. I can go into a questioning mode and go very slowly and carefully, but I can also jump right in and speed that process up. Could you talk a little bit more about what you mean by humble? Uh, sure. I, I mean, the, the, um, I guess the place to start is that, um, uh, you know, that Ed first started using that term in the helping book where there was a section called humble inquiry. And, um, in, in that sense, the idea of inquiry was as important as the idea of humble, um, which basically was rather than telling what you know, inquiring what somebody else knows or what the group knows. Um, so it starts with that, but then the, our sense of the word um, humility or humble is that you have to accept going into that meeting or into work that day that you you alone don't have the answers. It's a, um, it's a basic recognition that the, the group knows more or individuals at the table know more than you do. And the ultimate objective for everybody is to get as much relevant information out so you can make the right decisions. So um, Ed uses the term here and now humility, not in the sense of, gee, that suggests that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be confident or I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, somehow, you know, obsequious or subservient to other people. That's not at all what it means. It means that 
um, in that moment, I don't have the answers and I have to recognize that the, that the answer is probably in the group or it's in the minds of other people. And my job as a leader is to draw that out. So here and now, humility is just accepting that the, the, there, there's more wisdom in the group than there is in uh, any one individual. And um, the situation's volatile, it's changing, and uh, so it, it's important to be situationally aware um, on top of the recognition that you don't have the answer. Um, and that the, that you can work the answer out with the group you're in. Just to add to that, uh, one of the stories in the book is the story of this Navy captain who took over a, a low morale, low performing sub, Captain Marquet. The book title is uh, Turning the Ship Around. Uh, he figured out that the way to begin was to take all his chief petty officers, sit them around the table and said, are you guys satisfied with how this sub is running? That was his opening. The other thing just to add is that a lot of times we're asked about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's obviously sort of, it's a, it's a related concept, but, um, you know, our suggestion is don't think of vulnerability as um, as weakness as much as, you know, just reality. Everybody, and especially if we accept this VUCA concept, everybody is vulnerable to the pace of change and the things they don't know. So you go into work every day, you're vulnerable because something may have changed overnight that that is going to force a, a, you know, an adaptation or a new decision. Um, that's what vulnerable means to us. It doesn't mean some, uh, you know, inter interpersonal, I mean, some individual weakness. It just means the reality that, that things change so rapidly that you need to be ready to adapt. And, you know, and the related concept there is if you accept that you're vulnerable, it's going to be a lot easier to be curious about what, um, uh, you know, what, what facts are out there or what um, patterns are out there that you might be able to leverage, um, what information's available, what information might change your mind. Being open and curious to those things is critically important. And again, we all say these things, but we're trying to kind of ground it in a day-to-day, -day. if you, you, you know, in any group, in any meeting, if you go in with an attitude of, I don't have the answer. I'm more interested in what answers in, are in other people's heads. It draws, you know, an, uh, a net positive in terms of information exchange. I, I do think it's important to add that where I learned this, and to some degree I think I made Peter learn it this way, is uh, what we in OD originally invented, namely the T group. It's the T group where you learn about inquiry, where you learn about process analysis, where you learn about here and now situations, where you realize how vulnerable you are, that people can always put you down very easily if they choose to. So the short answer to how do you learn this stuff is go to a T group. Find some local sensitivity training outfit or find NTL groups because it is a kind of countercultural thing to think this way in a culture that is so imbued with individual competitive bureaucratic thinking. Lisa Hirsch Marin had a good question to ask and she said, how do you apply these principles in other cultures respectfully? For example, in France, uh, discussing personal issues in the business context is not a practice norm. Well, <clears throat> the reason I emphasize that these levels are societal culture, not business culture. They apply to the business culture, but it's society that determines 
where the boundary is mm -hmm. between personal and impersonal, between intimate and not intimate. So in every society, every national culture or ethnic culture, the boundaries between these four levels will be different. So you apply the broad model. In France, there will be some version of personization, but the, the content of it will be probably totally different because of the societal norms of what's personal and what's not. I have a very good example of <clears throat> at one of the workshops and an Indian woman from India said she has to probably quit her job in an American corporation <clears throat> because the friendly American colleagues always want to talk about family. <clears throat> they ask her questions that are entirely inappropriate in her Indian culture to talk about. And she, she's not able to get across to them. Look, I, I don't want to be in this conversation. So it's extreme enough that she's actually thinking of finding a different job. So these intercultural things are hugely important. But I'm willing to say every culture has some version of those four levels. That's, that's the generalization. But the actual boundaries and what's, what's in a given uh, boundary space will vary with the culture. Lolita has a question that I'm just, I'm so excited to ask. Um, how do you introduce personization into an organization whose culture does not encourage relationships between employees and managers other than work related? Well, you try, and if people don't pick up on it, uh, you go somewhere else. <laughs> Culture is very powerful, <clears throat> and we know in the healthcare industry, we've seen several examples of programs, process improvement programs, that very much dealt with level two kinds of things that got stopped by new CEOs coming in and saying, what is all this stuff? And undoing stuff that had already progressed. So I'm, I wasn't kidding when I say you try, but you may discover that the powers above you uh, are sufficiently level minus one right. or totally brainwashed into level two, uh, level one that they can stop you. And also we, you know, we put a lot of stories in the book of where, where all of this pertains, where it's been successful, maybe where it, 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 uh, it didn't apply, but it, it's very much the case that, that different um, organizational cultures or, or uh, workplace cultures, um, professional cultures are gonna respond differently. If you're in a highly transactional industry, it may be entirely the case that uh, that a level one transactional uh, sort of general MO is gonna is gonna perform better. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we're we're trying to talk about the um, the sort of the innovation industries in general, where we see this in particular as um, again, needing to tap, um, you know, the subtle information cues, the hidden information that's going to allow a company to be more innovative. Um, that's where we sort of are, are seeing more and more that this approach of uh, drawing on, you know, trust and building openness is more fruitful than a more than a, just a traditional transactional model. And particularly in the high hazard industries, healthcare, nuclear, air, airlines, where openness and trust is essential for performance. Okay. 
Have we run out of questions? No, no. Quang, do you do you have do you want to go or do you want me to? <laughs> can can you talk a little bit more about transparency and what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, sure. I, such I a just, buzzword I, today, it, isn't it? The, yeah, and I think that um, we've tried to make the argument in humble leadership that what we believe is important is openness, mm -hmm. and transparency is maybe something different. Um, transparency, uh, I think, is often used as a uh, as a sort of a requirement of information exchange, rather than a, 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 a you know a spirit of inquiry or or a um, an openness to information exchange. So when we talk about transparency, I often worry that that's more of a weapon than a tool. Like it's a it's a requirement that that we be transparent, not we believe we're going to be better off if we're transparent. So um, again, openness is it, to us is more of the mutual concept, whereas transparency is often a, a one-way transactional concept. And has been used in, in industry too much around performance issues. What people want to be transparent about is performance. You know, we want everyone to know how everyone is doing. Uh, and at the same time, it's hypocritical because if the employee says, can you show me your balance sheet at the top of the corporation? Of course not. You know, that's, that's privileged information. So the word transparency has a lot of baggage around what do you planning to be transparent about, whereas openness <clears throat> has more of a, uh, a negotiated quality, uh, openness in relation to what we're trying to do, uh, leading to trust. And I don't see transparency having any of those connotations. It's more, as Peter said, a weapon. I, I need to know how you're doing. And so we're going to open up all our performance measures and make them public uh, <clears throat> without realizing that in many cultural situations, that's exactly the wrong way to motivate people. That that's not the way you get better performance is by everybody knowing what everybody else is doing. So in your book, you have this graphic called Reimagining Leadership can you why i'm not hearing you speak a little bit referring to the slide that we're, we're yeah. reimagining leadership in this way okay can you walk us through this graphic this diagram so we understand the what you're what story you're trying to help illustrate for us in terms of humble humble leadership yeah. all right <clears throat> the the key differences between level one and level two are really illustrated very much in this chart in that level one is the transactional role-based bureaucratic job description way of doing things built around individual performance, individual reward systems, individual career ladders, and by implication, <clears throat> individual heroic leadership. That's the model we've been working on, you know. And we, we have endless books that talk about what you need to be to be one of these heroic leaders. Uh, this morning, we talked about character, integrity. It's, it's an endless task to try to identify what's in that lower left-hand corner. And we're saying it's all irrelevant to the VUCA world of complexity. Because in the complex world, it's all about relationships <clears throat> and it's all about getting to know each other personally. So it sort of highlights the, the great difference between the traditional heroic leadership model 
and the more group-based, uh, relational, personal model that's actually also more uh, heroic leadership is about the individual. Humble leadership is about the, the verb leadership. Mm -hmm. And leadership turns out to be a mixed bag of what individuals and groups do. <clears throat> it rotates around. Sometimes A is taking a role of, of saying what we ought to do, and then it shifts to somebody else. So that's what we mean by relational and personal. That would May, be my, May, my, May has a question. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think we, I think Ed, okay. Ed framed that okay. the way, yeah. May has a question. Do you have any suggestions for incorporating some of these ideas into the independent contractor industry where briefly stated the person with the immediate answer gets the work or the contract? Well, that <clears throat> very much depends on the trust level and whether the immediate answer is a valid answer mm -hmm. because in that contractor industry, so many games are played around what words mean and what budgets mean and what costs mean that I would think that it's exactly true that if, I, if I'm, say, a, a military unit and I'm contracting with uh, industry, we have a case like that in the book, the contracting that works is where the industry people and the military people and the academic people get to know each other personally, establish trust, so that when, when then proposals are made or budgets are set, you know that they're not playing games with you. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's very applicable, but how you get there, in, in the case that we have, a couple of cases in the book, it, it derived from the top people. The top people said, we're going to do this differently. We're going to be a high integrity, high trust, open negotiation on who gets what contracts. Uh, or in the other case, a, a senior executive VP who has to run six different industries and work with different CEOs, making an effort to get to know each of those CEOs personally, rather than trying just to understand what those industries do. So I think if the top believes in this humble leadership level two concept, they can begin the process and filter it down through the organization much harder to do this bottoms up. I really loved your chapter three when you talked about the Singapore story and how they really transformed um, everything they did with Yao's leadership. Yes, well, it's a good example that shows that hierarchy is not the enemy. Yeah. It's bureaucracy and how you use the hierarchy that's the problem. Singapore is a very, very hierarchic, autocratic, uh, political institution, but is completely a level two uh, social culture in terms of Lee Kuan Yew creating housing, creating jobs, uh, creating relationships with Western industries to, to build up the economic base of Singapore, when he was early on doing this, he was working very closely with colleagues, all of whom had kind of learned to trust each other and work together in their, during their years as, as students in the UK. He extensively used consultants who knew about city-states and what happened to Hanseatic cities and so on that, that would reveal the, the dangers of a place like Singapore. 
So while, while the public sees the autocratic hierarchy, what actually went on in Singapore was a huge amount of relationship building to make all of this happen. Um, May has a question. Was it May? No, Maria. She said, what would you put in the upper left and the lower right quadrants of this, of this graphic? Conflict. <laughs> oh. um, no, I, think, I think you might, in the lower right, you might put a lot of startups. Because um, so much of the time it is um, a couple charismatic leaders come together and um, they have very tight bonds and, you know, close relationships and they are very, you know, very personized. But it's also very individually focused. I think, it, at, again, at a, at, a, at a five person organization that's creating something, you know, crazy and new and change the world. Um, uh, a, a lot of the sort of the, the getting groups to perform better really may not be the challenge that they have. It's when they become a 200 or 2000 per person organization that those challenges might be greater. Um, I think you can be very successful as, you know, a, um, you know, a startup of, of five incredibly driven, you know, individualistic competitive people. Um, with very close relationships to each other. But when the organization scales, um, you may end up having, you know, problems uh, that, that have to do with that, um, that, that I-thou relationship as opposed to the collective or we relationship. I just want to throw in a hypothesis that Apple started in the uh, lower right with you know the huge individualism of Steve Jobs and the others around him, but with the new generation with Tim Cook and the way they built their headquarters as a great big circle, I just wonder whether they're beginning to evolve the notion that as they grow, they have to try to be more relational. It's just a hypothesis. Uh, but it intrigues me that they did not build a tower, that they did build a, a flat circle, and that Tim Cook sounds like a different kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I look at, at this point from, from startups to mature industry, I look at what kind of leaders are the general managers that they bring in when the founders are no longer the dominant force. The upper left, that's a bit of a puzzle. <clears throat> I mean, I think we, we also might have to look at this and say that there is that, that uh, sort of in, that industry reference point, that there are some industries that are just intrinsically more transactional than others. Mm -hmm. um, so you might look at a, uh, a capital markets institution or a bank or something that starts out very much as a, as a transactional entity and is realizing that in order to be successful, they have to create um, more personal relationships with their customers and evolve toward a more level two culture because um, the requirement of the industry, um, you know, retail banking started to require that, that they think about their jobs as less transactional. And it reinforces the, the incentive to think about their work relationships as less transactional as well. Again, another hypothesis. But. So uh, I work with a lot of IT leaders in various industries across different countries. And how would you describe, you started off this conversation today in this webinar talking about digital transformation and change. It's, it's society that we live in today. Um, what are some of the things we would see as outside consultants or even internal employees as these organizations move from heroic leadership to humble leadership? 
what are kind of like the telltale signs of indicators of that? Well, I mean, just in IT, I'd sort of give one example, which is how we've um, reshaped the way we develop software using um, Agile as the obvious example. You know, the waterfall method, which was the old, very um, structured, uh, uh, static, and, um, and linear way of thinking about how you develop software, to Agile, which is very much a level two, uh, uh, it, it, Agile culture is very collaborative. It's, it's, uh, it's very much a we mentality as opposed to a I thou handoff mentality, which is exactly what the waterfall way of thinking about things sort of ended up creating problems where you, it's so linear that you get to the end of the line and you realize you're two months behind. Well, Agile is designed to sort of address that, that shortcoming. Um, so I think there's lots of, there's lots of, of reason to be hopeful that um, in a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of highly innovative industries, um, they are realizing that, that um, uh, methods that are bringing decision makers and um, the, the, the people that, that know the relevant facts, bringing them closer together more quickly is actually very beneficial. Yeah. There, there is a good example that uh, I just experienced the other day in healthcare, the concept of huddles. Mm -hmm. They have lots of different kinds of huddles yeah. that bring together on a short run basis, the relevant parties that are needed, say for discharge or for some other thing. So what would you see? You would see more use of groups and meetings and task forces and places where connections are necessary and are being made versus in the lower left, you see antipathy toward meetings, you see antipathy toward group accountability. Uh, groups are generally bad in the lower left. They waste time. Mm -hmm. Whereas as, they, as you move to the upper right, you begin to see how valuable groups are and you learn how to do it right. You learn how to run good meetings and temporary groups and reshaping things. That's what I would look for. You guys, I, I cannot believe it's been if almost an hour. We have like one minute left. Wow. <laughs> so um, maybe we can ask one last question. Um, how could you just, how could you wrap this all up? What can I do today to make a difference and um, to promote more humble leadership in my life? Well, I will, I'll just share quickly one, one of my sort of <laughs> refrains is, is step away from the mirror. Stop <laughs> worrying about yourself. Oh. Um, because there's lots of there's lots of great books out there that will give you lots of um, you know growth and development ideas for yourself, mm -hmm. but it might actually be a little bit easier to step away from the mirror and go into work thinking about I'm going to focus on the other people around the table in this you know in this work group that I'm in or in a team that I'm trying to form, and think about um, you know what what we all might gain if every one of us had the psychological safety to share what we know. By bringing um, others up, you bring yourself up as well, right? That's, yeah, I, I believe that. Yeah. yeah. Leadership results from personization. So I would start with personization. At the dinner table, get more personal. Don't just talk about the weather and politics. Uh, ask a question about how was your day and what did you do today? Uh, so I, I don't think this needs to be linked totally. The, the leadership word gets us into that lower left, mm -hmm. whereas just living in a more personalized way enables leadership. There will be times when leadership is needed and it will arise. 
but don't start with how am I going to be a leader. Start with how am I going to be more personal. And again, we, we understand how uncomfortable that may feel. <laughs> uh, because because we, we've drawn these lines between home and work. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, we all know that the lines between home and work are going away anyway. Right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, be more like home at work. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ed, Ed and Peter. I mean, this topic, I could talk about this topic for hours. Um, if you haven't read the book, we will uh, we'll, we'll send an email out uh, shortly with the link. And there will also be a link um, that you can purchase the book. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, thank you, Quang. Uh, ISODC, thank you, um, everyone, for coming and joining us. And please make this a great day. And uh, call someone who would want to hear from you, OK? All right. Good That's advice. Great. <laughs> thanks so much to all of you around the world who, uh, who dialed in at this particular moment and thought this would be useful. We're, we're, we're thrilled. Awesome. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.